<laughs> hey, thanks, uh, Congresswoman Gabbard, for joining the show. It's it's an honor to have you on. First Thank time you. guest. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, and, and we have your sometimes friend and ally, Thomas Massey, who is a regular always, on the show. Always times friend. Always. friend. Yes. yes. Yeah, and I uh, I have to stop start off by thanking both of you. You've you've both been willing to take positions that are consistent with your your personal uh, philosophies of governance, even when, in your case, Congresswoman, uh, the Democratic Party wasn't really in line with what you were saying, and in your case, Congressman Massey, the the Republican leadership, and this. The, the issue I want to talk about today is the legislation that you guys just co-introduced, Protect Our Civil Liberties Act. And it strikes me that that you are in a minority position in both of your parties because um, since 9-11, the, the deep state has just run unabated. So, so what do you hope to accomplish with this? And I'll start with you, Congresswoman. Yeah, sure. First of all, thanks for having us on to talk about this important legislation that has been important for many years. This, this issue has been important for many years and it will continue to be important until these reforms that we've put forward in our legislation uh, are addressed. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunate that this is not a widely held view that we need to uphold our constitutional rights and our right to privacy, our right to civil liberties, uh, but but it's not. and. And over the years, as both Tom and I have worked with others, with a few of our other colleagues on both sides of the aisle to put forward real reforms to the Patriot Act, to things like Section 215 and Section 702 and others, the opposition really isn't one carrying great substance, in my opinion. There's not been a real vigorous debate on this. It's it's us putting forward our view about striking that balance between upholding our constitutional rights and ensuring our national security, this is the responsibility that Congress has, versus the other side, which kind of just comes with fear tactics, uh, much along the lines that we've seen in this post 9-11 era, saying that if you make these changes, if you take away these provisions that have allowed our intelligence agencies to run amok with this vast overreach violating uh, the privacy and rights of, of every American across the country, then there will be another 9-11 style attack. And that's always the retort that's given. Uh, some on the floor have even gone so far as to say people like Tom and I are helping terrorists plan another attack against Americans which is outrageous beyond belief. But unfortunately, this is the superficial nature of which this conversation has occurred in Washington. And, and again, this is not one party versus another. Um, uh, it, it points to the work that, that we as Americans still have to do before us to make sure that leaders in Congress get the message about uh, how important these changes are. This is definitely one of those us versus them things, and Republicans call it the deep state. I think some progressives at least used to call it the military industrial complex, but there's there's this thing in DC and all of the the private entities that glom onto it that don't want change. But if the American people knew this and understood this and had felt like they had the power to do something about it, this, this kind of seems like a no brainer to defend the fourth amendment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, by the way, thanks for having me on, Matt. You look a little bit like Father Time there uh, with that white beard. I'm um, going like, full Santa. That's that's my goal. Well, I was thinking Santa, but it's really more Father Time, I think, is what you've captured. But Or, or, or Gandalf, maybe. <laughs> the white wizard. Any case, uh, Tulsi's absolutely right. It's maddening some of the debates that we have with our colleagues on the floor. And, uh, and they do. They say that we're going to help terrorists. But our response to that is always the same. It's get a warrant. I mean, the this has already been solved. It's like they throw out these red herrings. Oh, we won't be able to spy on terrorists. We won't know what they're doing. Absolutely, you will. We, you know, our founding fathers said get a warrant, and they put in the the judicial branch in here as a as a safety valve, and uh, or as a check or a fuse, however you want to look at it. And um, one of the problems with getting a warrant is they've you know, uh, it's inconvenient for them, they say. You know, liberty is inconvenient. And then they've established this court that's just not 
always operating like a court uh, to make it easier for them to get a warrant and to remove the transparency. And they'll say, well, it's important to keep it secret, some of these things, and, and I agree, but ultimately somebody has to be accountable to someone. And so that's another thing that the, you know, the bill seeks to do is to have a little bit of reforms in the secret courts. But the answer is always just get a warrant, folks. Yeah. Yeah. So this, uh, to, to be clear, this bill repeals either large swaths of the Patriot Act and the FISA Amendments Act, or do you guys just say this repeals them? Well, there's, yeah. there's still things that they could do, but yeah, the Patriot Act needs to go away, all of Section 215. Um, and there's more to it than just that. It's not just the FISA Amendments Act and the Patriot Act. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I've worked with uh, Zoe Lofgren on, another Democrat who's concerned about privacy, is making sure that the government can't force companies to put back doors in their encryption. And uh, we've actually been successful in getting a small part of this bill that Tulsi and I have offered, a small part of it passed on the floor of the House in, uh, in the form of an amendment to appropriations bills. And uh, unfortunately, they've stripped that, those amendments out at the last second behind closed doors when they come up with the omnibus. But the portion that Zoe Lofgren and I were able to get in there, and Tulsi was also supportive of that, is to, is to keep the government from forcing companies to put back doors in their products. And we've got some uh, allies on this in the tech, you know, on the tech side, because as it turns out, it's hard for them to sell their computers and softwares and phones overseas when the folks overseas aren't really keen on having spyware from the American government already pre-installed on their, you know, gadgets. And so it's hurt our economy. It's hurt our American economy to pre-install the spyware and the back doors in these things. And it's why, you know, over overseas in Europe, they, you know, they'd rather have their, um, their version of the phones and software and the same thing in Japan. So we've got allies there in the tech industry. And also we've made the point that we're less safe if these back doors exist. We just got hacked, the government, 18,000 computers. If you've heard of the solar winds hack that just came out. Look, that's because there was root access to all of those things. Like our purchasing requirements required that the third party be able to update the software without the permission of the government. It's like ridiculous. So that's one example of how having backdoors and, and mandating access to uh, third party software can create liabilities that make us all less safe. Even the US government is less safe when they mandate backdoors and products and then buy those same products, they open themselves up to uh, uh, dangerous. So I don't think we're helping terrorists. They may be helping hackers by putting the back doors in. Yeah. Congresswoman, um, talk about the, the mass collection of, of phone data, which is one of the things that this legislation repeals. And I remember when Rand Paul was, Senator Rand Paul was trying to get the Supreme Court to consider the constitutionality of this. One of the arguments he made is that if you're collecting everybody's private data, you're not really focusing on people that are dangerous and the people that ostensibly the Patriot Act was was intended to protect us from. Do you, do you agree with that? Uh, I, I absolutely agree with it. And I've worked with Senator uh, Paul on, on a number of these kinds of related issues. The thing that, that kind of makes me scratch my head when people talk about why this mass collection is necessary is they say, um, that in order to find the bad actors, the terrorists, they're like a needle in a haystack. And in order to find them, you have to create the haystack in order to find the needle. It may, it, it's, it's not even logical. It's not a logical argument uh, what to speak of, of the, um, the fact that even now multiple courts have ruled these programs to be illegal uh, as well as, as we know, unconstitutional. Uh, I remember when I uh, woke up, I was relatively new in Congress when this program was first revealed, both to members of Congress and the public. And I just, I was mind blown that our own government was collecting, had, had records of every single phone call I had made, who I had made it to, and when that phone call had been made. And no, I've got nothing to hide, but it is a gross violation 
of our privacy. And like Tom said, that this mass collection of information without probable cause and without a warrant directly undermines every one of us and, and our Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, I've heard from some people who just say, yeah, you know, I don't care. I figure the government can see what we're doing anyway, and I got nothing to hide. That's all fine and dandy when people are in agreement with who's in government. But this is what I tell them. What happens when uh, a president that you don't support gets elected? Or what happens when you have people in power who have views that are different from yours? Only then are you going to start caring about the decisions that this government is making. And this is the problem with the hyper-partisanship in Washington right now, which includes, uh, what I think I think funnels the inability to, to make these changes is everything is fine as long as your party is the party in power. And then you flip out when the tables are turned and you wonder, well, uh, there, there, there is a double, there is a double standard there. So this is why it's so critical, why, why Tom has been such a great friend. And I've really enjoyed working with him on these issues is because they cannot be partisan in order for us to take a stand for, uh, these freedoms. They have to withstand these partisan winds blowing from left to right and back and forth so that, you know, while Tom and I may agree on some issues and disagree on others, I know we will always stand up for each other's rights to speak freely on those issues, to debate freely, to be able to vote in the way that we believe is best for our country and not allow any of our rights uh, to be undermined. I think that's really where, I think that that's really what gets to the heart of, of what we're trying to accomplish with this legislation. Yeah. And, and, I, and by the way, Tulsi's promised to help me from the outside uh, because it's going to be lonely on the inside. Tulsi Gabbard and Justin Amash are two of the least partisan people that I had the honor to work with. And they're both going to be gone on January 3rd. I'm sort of terrified that the prospect. <laughs> we'll uh, be making lots of noise still, okay. I'm sure, yeah. both Justin and I. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you guys, uh, the, the three of you have, have, have broken the... Uh, uh, tripartisan divide on on various efforts where you have Democrats, Republicans, and Libertarians all working together. And I think, I think, um, at least as a symbol for how Washington might work, I think I think it's incredibly powerful. And and I I continue to talk a lot on the show about the, this potential to sort of break through the hyper tribalism and partisanship that that dominates Washington D.C. And I think I think independents across the United States are, are hungry for that, but I I don't think we're there yet. But but going back to you, Congresswoman, I'm I'm reminded that uh, that James Clapper, uh, when testifying before Congress, uh, blatantly and explicitly lied about the, the the mass collection of of people's personal data, and yet nothing happened. The Obama Justice Department, the Trump Justice Department. Um, Nobody held him accountable for what what was a gross breach of the public trust, and it, it sort of it sort of asked the question like, if 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 we're counting on the executive branch to just police itself, it's not working very well. I, I think that's an understatement. Um, <laughs> you know, to see to see the uh, hypocrisy of James Clapper going and lying under oath to the United States Senate. Uh, about a, a program that was conducting mass surveillance on Americans without warrant or probable cause, uh, and not only not being held accountable for that crime, but then seeing the guy who exposed this illegal program uh, being prosecuted under the Espionage Act to the point where he can't even come home, primarily because, and he's talked, Edward Snowden has talked about this, because he knows that that in the American court of law, based on this heavily flawed espionage act, he he will not have his fair day in court because he will not be able to speak to why he did what he did. And this is something I've worked with uh, Dan Ellsberg on and introduced legislation to reform the espionage act so that those charged under it will have the very same rights that every American has in court to be able to uh, advocate on their behalf, why they did what they did, and, and then be judged by a jury of their peers. The fact that those, those prosecuted under nas national security concerns, the Espionage Act, 
do not have that right, just as Dan Ellsberg did not have that right after he released the, the Pentagon Papers, uh, just shows how deep the problems are uh, within our own government and the outsized amount of power the intelligence community has. Uh, and, and before I toss this back to Tom, I just want to mention, too, along those same, same lines of, of James Clapper, uh, not only not being held accountable, but you see him on TV almost every day as, as some great expert uh, opining on, on different things. And, and it's just the, the hypocrisy is mind blowing. But, but it also reminds me of a comment that uh, Senator, I think it was Chuck Schumer, made around the time of President Trump's election. I don't remember the exact quote, but basically it was a warning that if if Trump takes on the intelligence community, then he better watch out, as though the intelligence community is some autonomous entity that has greater power over our entire government, including the president of the United States, uh, and, and that we should all watch out, which means there is no real oversight or accountability over this so-called autonomous entity, as you said, some would call the deep state. It's, it's an incredibly dangerous situation that we're in. It's a very and, chilling comment from the senator. That's uh, and, and that's why it's important in the bill that Tulsi and I have introduced, there are extra pr protections for whistleblowers like exactly. Edward Snowden. And a lot of people, and maybe even people who are watching this are, are saying, well, he should have gone through the, re the proper process and he shouldn't have done, done it this way. Well, it turns out uh, even in in the last year, I asked the inspectors general in a in a uh, oversight hearing if the laws protect contractors instead of just employees, and I couldn't get a straight answer from the inspectors general. Like the people in charge of the law didn't couldn't tell me in that hearing that somebody like Edward Snowden would be protected under the Whistleblower Act as it exists now. And the problem with that is. Uh, most of our um, intelligence functions is outsourced. I mean, the con like Edward Snowden is not the exception. He's the rule that uh, a lot of this is, is contracted out. And so the people who would be likely to find out that uh, something illegal is going on would probably be the contractors. So that's why it's important. And I, and I went and reread our bill to make sure this is true, but it explicitly covers contractors and gives them whistleblower protection, which I think is really important to do. And it specifically states that anyone in our government who retaliates against a whistleblower, uh, as Tom has stated, whether they're an employee or a contractor, will be terminated. Yeah, and you have, you have both called on President Trump to consider pardoning Edward Snowden. And earlier this year, and this is this is all related to what we're talking about today, you both came out in defense of Julian Assange and an authentically free press. And it gets back to the accountability question, Congresswoman, that you were talking about. If they get to do what they did to Julian Assange, it pretty much undermines any hope of the press ever calling out um, uh, the government when it crosses these civil liberties bounds. Very clearly. And in the prosecution of Julian Assange through the, the trial, uh, the extradition trial that, that he's been going through, uh, the United States government made it very clear that they would continue to go after any media source uh, that, that exposes classified information uh, in, in direct violation of our First Amendment uh, based in our constitution that we have here. And, and you know this this should obviously cause be a cause of concern to the largest media entities that we know of people like the washington post the new york times people frankly who publish classified information from anonymous sources almost on a daily basis that again our government could go after them simply for publishing that information but also in this new media world that we live in we have uh, individual freelance journalists who have their own Twitter accounts or their own YouTube shows. Uh, ev this is not only a threat to the New York Times of the world, this is a threat to every single American and the freedoms that every one of us has to be able to share information, to be able to speak freely, and to be able to hold our own government accountable. 
that's why the situation that Assange is facing, uh, he's not an American citizen, but this prosecution is a direct threat and warning to every single American that if you do not uh, toe the line to whomever is in power in government, that they will come after, they'll come after us. It's, yeah. it's about the free exchange of information and ideas. And I'm always reluctant to uh, sign on to bills that give the official journalists protection without giving all American journalists, because it, all Americans uh, protection as the journalists have, because as Tulsi pointed out, it's there's not a fine bright line between a reporter who's just because what you report eventually gets printed on a piece of paper, does that make you a legitimate journalist? Or, I mean, why why isn't somebody who has a blog that has, you know, a million followers or 10,000 followers, why aren't they also given the same protections to disseminate information if it comes into their possession? Exactly. I'm, I'm so, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of uh, becoming uh, fundamentally skeptical that the next big reveal will come from the Washington Post or the New York Times or any of these sort of mega media outlets because they they probably have uh, conflicting interests that, that I don't even understand. But the, the nature of media today is that actual citizens can can do real reporting. And unless they're suppressed by our our um, uh, corporate and government overlords, that's where that's where freedom comes from. This this is essential stuff here. And, and this is where, um, I, I don't know if I'm getting too far off track here, but this is where the reforms to Section 230 are so critical, where uh, you know companies like Google and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, they have this legal immunity uh, because supposedly they're a free and open platform for people like you and me and Tom to be able to, to post our thoughts or views or, or whatever it is that we want to say. Um, which is different from publishers like the New York Times and other media sources who do not have this legal immunity because they are in fact publishers. They choose whether or not to publish an op-ed from me or Tom. They decide what information gets out. Uh, but but really when you look at uh, the people who are being silenced and deplatformed, who are being censored by these social media conglomerates, they are in fact acting as publishers and therefore should not have this legal immunity that has frankly allowed them to grow into these massive big tech monopolies, deciding which voices in this country get to be heard, deciding who they want to support or oppose in an election, deciding what kind of information Americans get, whether it's about elections or about COVID-19, deciding what's facts or what's not facts, what's science or not science. It's, it is a very dangerous path we're on, and, and it's why I've supported President Trump's uh, call when he said he would veto the NDAA unless Congress took action to get rid of Section 230, in my view, or actually do the real reforms that this, um, uh, that this section requires so that these big tech monopolies get their legal immunity removed because they are in fact publishers, are publishers while still supporting uh, platforms that don't uh, censor and don't um, uh, mediate what, determine what kind of information that we can see, allowing them to be able to continue to provide that free and open public square. So so my bias when I confront monopolies is, is pretty libertarian and I, I would love a, uh, deregulatory, reducing barriers to entry type thing. And I think uh, Congressman Amash disagrees with you on this point. Uh, Congressman Massey, where are you on this? I'm leaning toward Tulsi's direction on this because you can't have it both ways. I mean, it's the government with Section 230 who has stepped in and given them special privileges and immunities. Uh, you know, the libertarian position on this is you get your day in court. And sometimes I run afoul of Republicans who want tort reform, et cetera, et cetera. I, uh, I'm even, I've even been supportive of making sure everybody can get uh, money for a public defender, for instance, which upsets some of the Republicans. But I think, uh, you know, we have three branches of government, and uh, one of the main functions is to have a court that can adjudicate when somebody's been harmed or not harmed. Laws can't take care of everything. You can't presume people are, are uh, guilty 
or of something and then try to overregulate them. I'm more in favor of letting people do their thing. And then if somebody disrespects somebody or hurts somebody, they need to be accountable for that. And the courtroom is where you, you get the uh, remunerated or find justice. So let's go back to uh, a Congresswoman. You mentioned just, Justin Amash early. And as you both know, he has been consistently complaining about the secretive omnibus wait till a panic Christmas <laughs> Eve type legislating that he's, he's been demanding for some sort of open and legislative order where the People's House in particular has um, can actually represent the interests of their constituents. And I'm, I'm thinking about, um, and, I, and I, wanna, I know we're short on time, so I want to wrap up on this, um, but the Patriot Act was passed in a massive panic uh, days after the attacks of 9-11, and it was basically the wish list of the military-industrial complex that had been sitting on the shelf, rejected by Congress again and again and again. I'm old enough to remember the Wall Street bailouts, were, which were, again, sort of a bipartisan panic where they they jammed this stuff through before the people had any ability to review what was happening. And both of you took a position just a couple days ago against the latest uh, COVID slash stimulus bill. I'm not sure what we're calling it now, um, because uh, almost on procedural grounds first, and as we learn more about it, there's just a it's just chock full of things that are good for Washington and not necessarily good for people. Congresswoman, do you, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, the, this bill, again, I mean, over 5,000 pages long. I, I checked the time we got it, I think, at 2.34 p.m. Um, in the afternoon, and we're told that we'd have votes. I think the first series was four or five hours later. And naturally, I and my staff, we'd started diving right into it. Uh, using the the search function to try to look for certain areas with red flags, but just understanding that there was no way, there was no way that we even as a team could get through this legislation to actually know what's in it. And and what what we get, and I'm sure Tom gets maybe something similar, is kind of a section by section summary that's provided by the Democratic staff and the caucus. And I started scrolling through that. And even in that, I saw a lot of problematic things. But once we started going through the text of the of the bill itself, there was a lot that was in there that was not in the section by section summary. Uh, so no member of Congress can say that they went through and read this whole thing before they cast their vote. So that number one should be a disqualifier on its own, because as Tom and I, we, we've been around long enough to know that these things get that. Uh, get thrown in there intentionally in the dark of night and and are not talked about. They're not in the section by section summaries because they know that people would probably have a problem with it. and and the the massive hundreds of billions of dollars that went to corporate special interests and and foreign governments and and all of these other things while saying, "Hey, guys, this is a great Covid relief stimulus bill. Here's six hundred bucks is 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 worse than a joke. It, it's offensive and a slap in the face to the people who, you know, have been sitting in their car for hours in food lines trying to get some some food from the food bank and worried about eviction as we head into Christmas and in the new year. There's there's just uh, it, it was offensive to me and I got I got pretty pissed off about it and knew that there was no way that I could support this thing. Yeah, we and we uh, we control F these bills as much as we can, Matt, which is. With Tulsi talking about the search function. We yeah. just control F, control F, control F. My staff is plugging in keywords and um, trying to find out what's in this bill. And this is, I think, something happened that ne I've never seen happen in Congress. They created a bill so big it collapsed on itself and it crushed a few of them in it. Like, they always try to get too cute. They, I say they put all the hostages in one room and won't let anybody out until you know they get a deal. And so the 12 hostages were the 12 appropriations bills. Those were in here. And then the, the stimulus payments, you know, those hostages were, were in here. And people really got uh, uh, offended, as they should have, that the relief for them was tied to, for instance, $700 million to Sudan or $10 million for gender programs in Pakistan. And the, the irony is 
you know, they thought they would force a lot of Republicans and Democrats to vote for things they didn't want to vote for if they tied it all together. But what they did is they created this immense backlash from the public. And you saw the president, whose uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin was negotiating this bill with Pelosi and, and uh, McConnell. Uh, well, the president came out against the bill once he found out what was in it. So even it was too big for even the president to know what was in it. And I think that's when something has finally just gotten too big, when the people supporting it start running from it. Yeah, yeah it's, I assume it's, it's going to be a liability for those who voted for it as we discover all of the junk in it. And it's I mean, it's it's literally a Christmas tree that all of these pre-existing agendas, good or bad, have been just thrown in there. Uh, I think, Congressman Massey, you've done the math. And if you took uh, $900 billion and actually distributed it to families that have been unemployed by lockdowns and COVID, um, do you have a new number for that? Well, I mean, uh, if you take, I'll just do it in real time. This is always dangerous. But uh, if you take 900 billion <laughs> and divide it by 300 million, uh, I think you get $3,000 per person, just rough numbers. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if you took, here's the number that Warren Davidson introduced me to, 3 trillion divided by 3,000 counties in the United States is a billion dollars per county. And I've yet to find a county, regardless of its size, that has seen a billion dollars come into it. So, that, but yet there, are, every county on average is owes a billion dollars now for the packages that we've passed. So uh, the question is, where's is that money going? Well, Wall Street has done just fine. I mean, it's literally doubled in the, in the, middle of a pandemic, right? The, the best thing, the thing that has done better than anything else is the stock market. So that might be an indicator of where some of this money has gone. Congresswoman, I'll give you the last word on this. The, the problem that I think the root cause of these many different challenges we've talked about in this conversation is that we have too many people in Washington who've forgotten why they're there who've forgotten the people who send us here to work for them and end up, uh, this, the result is you end up with things like this bill that we just voted on a couple of days ago, where uh, the well-being and the interests of the American people themselves are almost just barely, barely an afterthought. Uh, in order to actually get to a place where we can solve problems, have vigorous debate on these issues, We've got to get to a place where uh, the people in Washington uh, who are supposed to be representing the people of our country are actually fulfilling that mission. This is not an easy task. It requires big change, uh, and it requires an involved and informed uh, electorate. But uh, this is the challenge and task that we have before us, that the people's house actually represents the people. So one of your final acts as a member of Congress was to join with Congressman Massey on this repeal of the Patriot Act. I'd love to have you back on once you become a private citizen to find out what you're up to next, because I'm thinking that Congressman Massey and the rest of us that, that believe in these things are going to need some help from the outside. I'm in. The mission continues. <laughs> Congressman, you're looking a little nervous. You're losing both the Mosh and Gabbard. Um, do you have your armor on? I, I don't know uh, what we're in for now with uh, with those two gone. Um, I'm hoping there'll be some good freshmen. I talked to Tulsi uh, just a couple nights ago, uh, when, by the way, she was the only, as far as I knew, the only Democrat who voted to give us more time to read the bill and also voted against the bill when they wouldn't let us have the time. Uh, but I told her I'm going to work really hard to learn all the freshmen's names and try to save them from the swamp when they get there uh, on January 3rd. And because I know there's some good ones in there. Everybody I feel like comes to DC, whether Republican or Democrat, with, with an honest and genuine desire to change things there. And when they get there, they're just so overwhelmed with the odds and with the process. And the question is, when you get there, do you call out the process? Will you stand up and tell the emperor whether it's your speaker or the other speaker, that uh, they have no clothes or they have no mask or whatever you, uh, analogy you want to use here, 
Uh, or do you just sort of go along and say, man, maybe I can get some crumbs. Maybe I could get one little thing done if I just go along. And, uh, and so my hat's off to Tulsi for being one of the people who get there, who got there and said, no, this is wrong. It's not just the bills that are wrong. It's the process that's wrong. And that's how we'll get things fixed. We, if, the, if the people who could be like Tulsi Gabbard when they get there, if they had a better process, then uh, we could really get some things done. So I know it's not sexy to talk about, but we've got to get the process fixed so that people can work across the aisle, so that when Tulsi and I try to work together, we're not defeated by the process, so that when we want to amend bills, we, you know, we have a voice. And, and like on this COVID omnibus bill, whatever you want to call it, one of the really amusing things would be to go back and watch the hour or two of debate before it passed, because nobody who objected to it or opposed it was really given any significant time to point out the stuff that was in it. Thank you both. Uh, it looks like Congressman Massey, who is returning, gets the last word on this. I look forward to, <laughs> I look forward to future conversations with both of you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.